passion. That's what you're going to get today when we talk about IT, bringing it into the hybrid remote culture. So if you're wondering how to develop employees who have gone all over and then coming back and what do you do with it and what are best practices, then today with Dave Sobel, you're in for a treat. Lean in and listen. Welcome to Masters of Employee Development, Mike Acker's YouTube segment devoted to training team members in any type of organization. Your host is a best-selling author, corporate trainer, and business leader. Find out more about Mike at MikeAcker.com. Each episode, Mike welcomes a CEO, HR director, or other experienced manager responsible for leadership and development. Together, Mike and his guest expert discuss training successes, challenges, and best practices. Lean in, listen, and take part in a community dedicated to improving life through increasing leadership. Now, here's your host, Mike Acker. Dave, welcome to Masters of Employee Development. I'm excited for a different take of what we're doing today. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Mike. This is going to be great fun. Now, you and I were arguing a little bit, arguing in a light sense of whether people should have self-view on or off when they are in Zoom mode or Teams or whatever they're using. So tell me why, tell me wrongly why you think, <laughs> <laughs> tell me wrongly why you think that that self view should not be on there. So my take on it is I think you definitely take, turn it off. And I think that the brain doesn't like to see itself, spends too much time worrying about your own appearance, the way you present. And when you're trying to engage and be present, with with somebody that is uh, you know <laughs> that is in that space, that's just something that you really need to to be careful of. And so I turn it off because I don't want to spend my time thinking myself. I want to be engaged with the pe person or people on the other side. And my take on it is more of this, especially my space. You're on the IT space. You're you're helping in that area. I'm helping on communication. And I always tell people this: like if I'm standing way over here and I don't know that you can't see me, then I can't change. But if all of a sudden I stand over, I see myself, I'm like, oh, I can make the change. And so right. it helps us with awareness. And so, but but I, what I'm saying is it's like, so you get yourself ready, right? Like before the meeting, you get yourself all prepped, you position yourself, you get your lights to look good. And then you turn that off and, and be in the moment and communicate with the person. Because if you leave yourself on, you'll spend all your time going, oh, like I look a little funny or I'm sitting wrong or I'm squirming or my smile doesn't look right. And, and I think you just don't internalize it well because that's not natural. If you and I were standing in a physical space, I wouldn't be looking at myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let me let me push back again. See, when I'm up on stage, I'm hyper aware of where every part of my body is. And so being on the camera actually helps me. So I'm actually aware if I'm doing something like this with moving my hand, if you're listening to audio and kind of waving my hand to the side, I'm hyper aware of the sound my, my watch makes. And a lot of people aren't hyper aware. It's just something I've learned from 20 years of being on stage. Like right now I'm up on my toes. And so I'm aware of all these different things that I do. And most people aren't. And so the screen makes them aware, which makes them a couple different things, but they can adjust and they can learn. You're not wrong, but, you're, <laughs> but what I'm also, but what I'm looking at is when I'm looking at entry, like people that are not comfortable with this all, all, I want to make them effective quickly. And I want them to be in that moment and not withdraw into themselves. And if they spend too much time thinking about that, that stuff, as opposed to thinking about what the other person's saying, particularly in this medium, you're talking about like a stage environment where I'm trying to broadcast to a ton of people. I'm saying when I'm in a small meeting with two or three people, I need to be engaged with those people okay one more one more reason why i think they should be on <laughs> because and this is what i love i love that really there is no right or wrong here so right oh totally <laughs> the the thing that i really think is really important is that people understand what they look like and they understand what they sound like and they play that back a whole bunch and they come to terms with it either it's accepting it or improving it or appreciating it, which comes out in my next book, which is signing a contract with the major publisher this week, which uh, we'll talk about some other time. But in that, that way you can know what you're doing and you come to terms with it instead of fight against it. But I think if you fight against it, either get rid of it or come to terms with it. I mean, ultimately, you, you've said the important keys. 
we're both right at some level. So people are going to need to take the bit that works for them and find the way that they are most effective. And by the way, either answer may be right depending on the circumstance. In a small meeting, you may want to be very present. In a large meeting, I want to be very aware of how I'm presenting. They're both true, but it yeah. might be situational. And situational is super key when we talk about remote. True, very true. You know what's interesting here is that there's a level of comfort. And I always think that people need to try the other side of comfort. Well, not always, but often they need to try a different side of comfort. And if you're a video guy and, you, and you've and you never looked at, had it off, then try it off and then vice versa. Yep, I'll give you a great situational example on this. So I'm in, we're talking right now, I'm in my studio, right? Like I'm sitting in my studio, this is prepped. I also do some Zoom stuff with friends. I actually find I can't use my studio for that setup when I'm trying to be social because I fall into work mentality too fast. And I have a different rig <laughs> that is set so that I can sit on the couch and be different and be more, be a different headspace when I'm hanging out with friends online and like gaming or something like that. And it's about the way I present and so it's about using the right tool in the right situation. So the situation is something we need to come back to. And before we get there, I love what we're talking about, the different aspects right here. And I have some notes of different areas where Dave and I are going to go to help you and go remote or help your employees work remote. But before we dive into those questions and really get into the situational and hybrid and remote culture, video culture, Dave, who are you and why are you a good person to talk about this subject? Sure. I'm Dave Sobel. I am host of the Business of Tech podcast. It's a five-minute daily news and commentary podcast focused on the delivery of IT services. But I'm a 25-year vet of the delivery of IT services. I own and operated my own company delivering those services. Then I worked for software companies delivering software to support those situations. And now I went off to, as an analyst to help grow this space. And I'm spending tons of time thinking about like what you need to know to be effective, not only in IT, but specifically those providers that deliver those services to end customers, like all the people we talk to. So what I love about the conversation we're going to have here, it's different than the typical Masters of Employee Development, where we're talking about what do you do in leadership structure? How do you get systems in place? We're going to talk about some of the IT, some of the remote aspects, some of the technology behind it. And the, the great thing Dave and I discovered here is that while he's focused a lot on this aspect, the IT part of things, the systems here, I focus on the communication skills, the emotional intelligence one has to have in it. And I've written books along those subjects. So it'll be fun to see how these two kind of marry together and, and partner well. But Dave, you had a fascinating concept of hybrid that I thought is not something that most people think of. So talk to us about what does hybrid culture mean? Set us straight. Yeah. So it's funny because everyone's talking about, oh, we're going to hybrid work. Oh, we're going to start working in a hybrid. And I think everyone is defining it wrong. Because what they're talking about too quickly is they're saying hybrid work is, well, you're in the office a certain number of days and you're out of the office another set of days. And I just look and I go, that is completely arbitrary. And anytime I look at an arbitrary distinction, I know it's wrong <laughs> because it isn't about how many days you're in and how many days you're out. It's about using the tools in the right place at the right time. When I think of hybrid work, I actually associate it much more with the idea of asynchronous work, the idea of I'm using the tools to be effective at the right time. Look, I'm a remote guy. I love working remotely. And I always acknowledge, yeah, there's times you want to get together physically. And so those time you want to get together physically, get together physically. And those other times there's job, there's work that is completely appropriate to do elsewhere. And when I think hybrid, it's about empowering both the individuals and the organization to make the right choice based on the needs. So for example, if we say, you know, we're going we need to pull together five people and the best way to do it is quickly and efficiently, and we're going to do it online. 
But maybe we there's another situation where we want to pull those five people and we want to go deep on some creative work, brainstorming. We need physical human interaction. We pull those people together and we empower the organization to make those choices rather than just say, oh, it's two days in, three days out. So setting this kind of straight in a way there, hybrid, if you're just showing up to the office two days, working at home three days, what would you call that? A mess. <laughs> I, I mean, because because if I think about it, there's no reason for that, right? So because what's going to happen is people are going to fall into the work they need to do less about using the location as a tool, right? Mm -hmm. If I say you're in the office three days, I know without a doubt that a good portion of that time, people are going to sit by themselves in their office and do some tasks. Did that need to be done in the office? No. Could that have done remotely? Sure. I also know on the remote day, there's going to be a task that needed some level of human physical interaction and arbitrarily couldn't happen that day. And those are all just wasteful. It's just the a silly way we're trying to compromise because it's easier than thinking it through to its logical extreme. Because the hybrid became the name really when, I mean, in office workers, pandemic, shift home, work home, wait a minute, we have these offices that we spent a lot of money on and that we want to get back to some and the different reasons that people want to get back, which many are really good. And so now let's do maybe dual officing, you know, office at home, office in the offices. I think it's a compromise because people don't want to solve the bad management problem. Wow. <laughs> like, like I really think that what we're doing is we're compromising for managers <laughs> that don't want to learn the skills to you to, to manage disparate workforces. It's a lazy, well done management style to walk around the office and physically look at people and assume that means they are working. <laughs> right. A bunch of bunch of bad managers can walk around like Lumberg out of office space and can say, oh, yeah, I see all my people. They're very busy. Right. And they and rather than be disciplined about actual management, they can do the like, well, I'll do the drop in management, you know, and I will rather than be disciplined and organized about building a culture and accountability into the org. Okay, so and I'm sure you write out all about this in your in your work and your blogs and all the stuff that you do, and we'll make sure that we put those in the show notes. But what is a good system of management for when you are effectively doing hybrid? You're in person for in person things. You're remote for things that can be done remote. What are some systems that you're coming up with? You're seeing in other places that works very well. Yeah, it's I don't about teach systems. I teach the communication and emotional intelligence. So I'm very curious about this. Yeah. So, and by the way, there's a lot of them. And I'm going to, I always start this by saying, like, look, everyone wants the one. The one is the one that works for you and your org based on what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. But it comes down to thinking much more about work as a work product than as time, being outcome driven versus time driven. 40 hours, if we think about it in a knowledge work environment, is entirely arbitrary. 40 hours comes from factories when we needed physical movement of people where they were acting essentially like robots to do a certain bit. And they, in order to create physical things, they set an amount of time and that became, it was 50 and 60 hours. And then we had, you know, unions and they shut it all down. It used to be seven, six and seven days a week. And they, they brought it down to an arbitrary compromise of 40 hours. When we talk about knowledge, the creation of, of the you know creative things, which the vast majority of office work is now, it's about the product. Did you write the book? Did you write the article? Did you create the sales number? Did you generate enough revenue? Did you talk to the right number? Like, to, did you drive the pipe in the right way? Those are all work things, and ultimately, time does not matter. What do you want? Like, if, you th if we think about a really great salesperson, right? We don't measure them based on how many hours they worked. We measure them based on the revenue they brought in. I'll pay a rainmaker who can work an hour a week and bring me in millions and millions of dollars, and they can spend the rest of their time on the beach, right? Because they sure. hit, my, hit my goal. 
it's a version of that applied to work. And I, it, it takes- So let me pause right here. Yeah. So in developing hybrid, maybe a great way to say this is think outcome instead of time. 100%. It's 100%. It's about outcomes, right? And it's, it's why you see interesting experiments going on. In the UK, they're doing a massive investment in a four-day workweek experiment, right? Norway's already done a bunch of this. Why? Because they're just sort of saying, well, we're going to play with this a little bit <laughs> and try and be product work outcome based less than time, knowing at some level, we still do have to track some time. But the main goal is, can we hit the output that we want? You know, at this point in time, I have five people on my team, but in the past, I've had larger teams and smaller teams. I've been the solo guy and all those kind of different things. Yeah, what I've do. seen personally, <laughs> right. And what I've seen personally is at the beginning, you, you do give more time because it takes more time to make sure that the outcome you want comes out. <laughs> right. And then over the course of time, those people gain your trust. And the time that you're there is more maybe finessing some things or giving the feedback. And often for someone who is that rainmaker, it's more just to make, remind them that, that, hey, you appreciate them. Oh, sure. And by the way, again, nothing, nothing's an absolute, including what I just said, right? <laughs> and so you're finding the right navigation for that. But I mean, think about it in, in even the simplest stuff, right? If I call, you know, call a plumber out to, to do some work on it, I, I may be spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars for him to come out and touch one thing and fix my problem. Sure. I paid for the experience, not the time. That yeah. guy or girl knew exactly how to solve that problem, and I didn't, and I paid for that solution. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Gladly, 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 before. gladly. Think about your your people the same way. And frankly, you can empower them. What's cool about what's happening now is, is we can give them so many more tools to be good at this and particularly reward performers because they can deliver the way they want to deliver based on, on outcomes. Right. Now, is there time then for time-based jobs? Of course, of course. Yeah. And there's obvious ones, right? Like retail, <laughs> and, right? you know, we get into and anything in hospitality, right? Of course, there's tons of that. But oftentimes, guys like you and I are spending a lot of our time on knowledge workers, you know, office people that are in the offices that are creating intelligence more than they're necessarily creating service around a time. I think that's really important and really to do the work. And it sounds like David could be the type of guy that you have this kind of conversation with where you are really analyzing what you need in the hybrid place and maybe shifting some of the, the structures that you had in the past and doing something new and communicating and developing people in new ways. Let, let me go to another question that's interesting on this. What, when we look at companies developing their remote workers, what kind of a continuation of this, what are some things that a company can do to effectively do that with all remote? So we're not even talking about hybrid now. They've gone remote, they realize that they don't need to go back in, they're not doing the hybrid thing, or maybe they're doing once a year type thing, whatever that might look like. But what are some ways that a company from the nitty gritty of supplying them the right type of tech to the larger end items? Yeah, I mean, we, we can easily start, most of these tech, most tech guys will start with a list of, well, they've got to have this, right? Like camera, yeah. my good mic and lights and all that stuff. They'll start with the, with the devices. And, and I want to acknowledge that, yeah, that super stuff's important. Where I actually think that the most important thing you can, can do- Can I pause right there? I yeah. think that's kind of like giving people the uniform. Right. When you go to Starbucks, like when I worked at Starbucks when I was like 19 years old, they gave me an apron. They didn't make mm -hmm. me make my own apron. Right. And, and that's what, that's what a good- that aspect. Yeah. But what's next, and to use your Starbucks analogy, is they also taught you how to do the, the pieces. And I yeah. think I think it's super important, and most organizations do not do this, is invest enough in the training to be effective using the tools, mm -hmm. right? It's it's all one, it's all well and good to give somebody a microphone and a camera. But if you don't actually spend the time teaching them how to use it. For as simple right. as you have to know where to sit, you have to know how to like where you, where you should, how you should talk into it, how to modulate your voice and go down and go up and the re and then more importantly, the why of these things, for example, and you've, you spent time on this, right? Teaching people 
to be remote is an actual skill to communicate effectively remotely. Yeah. Your skills are a little different. You oftentimes go a bit bigger, right? Yeah. Emotionally bigger. I find I get off a, a really good call. I need to take a break because I'm actually a little more tired because than I then even I might have done an on stage presentation because I had to go bigger. Right. I had to go bigger to get through the little box in order to convey the emotion that I wanted to. Yeah. Down to people throw uh, online collaboration tools, Slack, Teams, right? They throw them at people and then they don't teach them how to use it. Like, right. what are the effective ways to communicate? What are the kinds of communication that are effective within a tool like that? And what isn't? What's good in chat? What's good in email? What's good in a video call? And by the way, let's acknowledge there's a space where physical human interaction is required and knowing yeah. the right tool at the right time. The reason I talk about this as much as I do is I actually have been imploring IT services companies to be involved more of that culture stuff. <laughs> Get good at the stuff you talk about because I think that's where the real value unlock is for the business. My gosh, right now I'm just going to hire you to promote me, do like a, do a, commercial for this because that's what the whole book speak and meet virtually is about it's even telling people where to stand for example as if you're watching this and not just listening to this the way that dave has himself set up is that his eyes are closer to the top one third mine are as well and ideally you want your eyes right around this top one third of the screen he's also centered so he's off the side to the left he's looking straight on so even though when he's looking at me it looks like he's looking at the camera he's got the light behind the, that but he's also got a nice backlight so you kind of see some of the stuff behind he's chosen like i have an interesting back set of items behind him so it's not just like a bed or a blurred screen which makes your head smaller or a backdrop and i get sometimes you got to do those things but right. if you can set it like this, so even observing Dave and his posture and his setup and what he's chosen to wear for it is such a huge aspect. And without even realizing it, a lot of people are diminishing their presence and diminishing their ability to get their point across simply because they're not doing some of the stuff we're talking about. And I, I'm a big believer that you also have to understand the why. If you teach yeah. the people the why of these choices, immediately they will not think it's arbitrary. They'll go, oh, okay. And then they become craftspeople. They learn to leverage the tools effectively, but you've got to invest in that. And for me, again, most technology providers just deliver the tech and they're not getting the extra value. They're positioned so well to be the people that solve that problem. And I say like, go in there and I advocate, make more money, deliver better solutions, be more effective by doing the whole thing, deliver the tech and the investments in training and culture to help your customers be successful. Okay, so going back to the question that sparked this great discussion right here, it was how can companies continue to develop their employees remotely? So it's provide that that tech, sure, that's giving them the apron, but then tell them how to make the lattes. Yes. Tell, and, tell them and, how to and, use it. And continually invest in that throughout the org. <laughs> you know, and and by the way, it, it all starts with, with an investment in culture. You have to believe in that. It has to start from the top. It has to be a deliberate investment in yeah. making that work. It does not happen accidentally the same way that culture doesn't happen accidentally in a physical office. You have to make the effort. And there are some areas where yeah. I always will see remote's a little harder, but it also unlocks real potential and allows you to hire more people that are in broader place. You're not restricted to geography. You yeah. can work it out, you know, you can let people, you could be a 24 by seven organization. There's so many unlocks that I think it's worth it. And by the way, I immediately also seed there are now real world culture environment reasons that we will not be going back. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 we're not going back. This is the, the, the genie's out of the bottle. A bunch of employees have all figured out, hey, wait a second, I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> They've sold their cars because they could get more money out of it. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, there's all the side that you don't see. We often like to talk about people at work and just them in their box at work. We're not talking about the two thirds of their life that they spend not at work that is actually driving decisions. The number one reason people aren't going back they don't want to go have a community more. 
<laughs> right. 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 They they don't want a commute anymore. It's a completely obvious reason, right? They get more time with their family. We've all discussed in the last two years, everyone's been through a collective trauma. They've learned family is important, friends important. I don't exist solely for this. And they are much more conscious of the time that they're spending. And I totally believe that employers that get smart about this are going to win and they're going to win big <laughs> because yeah. they're going to attract the best people. They're going to, they're going to build cultures that are very effective. They're going to be able to do things they've never been able to do. But by the way, it doesn't just happen. Right. There's a company that I interviewed one of the founders of, uh, one of the leaders of Jonathan Kendall a while back, maybe in January or something from virtual worker. Now he used to be part of MentorBox. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. The whole company is growing basically by one employee a day. And it's because, <laughs> it's because they're, they're leaning in mm -hmm. and they're, they're doing this all the more. And so just so interesting why people need people like you and people like what I do. I have a, I have a train the trainer program that does exactly what you're talking about. Yep. And I'm sure you have these kind of consultants like, look, do you, what, what kind of role do you find yourself in now? My guess is it's shifted in the last two years. So now I'm totally curious about some of the more offerings that you have. This isn't even just to promote you, which I always let people do at the end, but now I'm totally curious. Well, so in music, I'm a, I'm a media analyst, actually, is what I do. My, and my actual product is the daily news and commentary podcast that I do. I'm trying to make the IT services space, often called MSPs as well, managed services providers. I'm trying to make that space better at what they do. I want them to be more effective companies. Okay. I want them to be more. And, and I do that through a media product. And I, my, my yeah. business model, everyone should understand how people make money. I have a media product. I have a podcast. I, I sell some ads. That's the number one way that I make money is by valuing the attention of my audience, delivering some real value every single day. And I ask them to listen to one ad a day. <laughs> and that's, and that's the ask. Hey, that's, that's what I do. That's so cool. But there's so much value in that. And so what I love about that right there is you're not even selling yourself as to go in and fix these problems, but people can read this and then use that to educate themselves so that they can develop others yep. and they can that's, develop that. That's exactly the idea. And, and I mean, because I look at the, when you, when you look at what's out there, there is so much IT services built into every company, right? That everyone's working with it. And that's that. And those providers need to be really great. There's, a, and it's a great opportunity. It's a fantastic space where I've spent my entire career. Uh, and so I think about those guys and girls and making their businesses more effective. Cool. Let's talk about some best practices of video culture. That was one thing that you and I we're discussing a little bit and we've kind of woven in some, but let's just go through some best practices, maybe some bad practices. Now we had kind of a fun debate about um, having the self view or not the self view, but what are some other practices that we can discuss here? Yeah. I mean, it's so, so the, the second, I mean, you, your, your stuff would be the, the, almost the way that I'm going to say is like learning specifically how to communicate online. Um, it, it goes beyond just the like, have a good mic, have good lights. It's a, you need to know how to use those tools, right? So yeah. again, you, you've talked through like the, how you present yourself. Those things matter a whole lot more than I think people think, it's true. Um, you know, and, and then it, I extend it out to, you should get, be trained. And if your company doesn't do it, train your, get, go out there and find the resources right. to specifically use the technology tools that you're being given. Okay. okay. So talk to us about the technology tools. Because you've mentioned a couple, but what are some of the common technology tools and what are just some like quick tidbits on things that they need to know about these different technology tools? Yeah. So like, so if I think about like, so if you sort of bucket them into the various communication tools. So of course, we've always had email, right? And I, I will smile and go with a lot of people. They don't actually know how to use email. Many people <laughs> don't actually know how to be effective in email and what email is good at. Email is not good at everything. <laughs> it yeah. is not a tool for everything. It is not the only <clears throat> communication method. For example, now we have tools like Slack and Teams that allow us for that more real-time communication. Right. But again, not everything goes into to Slack and Teams. I'm a believer, by the way, in turning off all notifications. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't, I don't have notification on anything mm -hmm. because yeah. because I make the argument of everything always wants your attention all the time. That means it is actually not important. Are you are you making fun of me because Amazon just dinged twice over there in the background? Mom, didn't, hear, like didn't, actually, <laughs> didn't actually hear. But but I but I, I'm just I yeah. But it, but it, it's funny because to think about. But like I actually do. I'm one of those people that do believe in uninterrupted portions of time. 
Yeah. You know, like actually being very deliberate about that. Right. Um, it's, and you have to set the tools up because by default, they want your attention. By yeah. default, they have a million notifications. They will notify you on everything. And that is not, I think, the best way to leverage those tools. Um, you know, so, and, so is that even in the training sometimes telling people, look, we have Slack and it's a great one for this. We understand that just because you get slacked right away, message right away, DM'd right away, or emailed right away, for that matter, you don't have to respond right away. Sometimes there's this expectation that I got something, I got to respond right away. Exactly. And and that is, that is a both a training at an individual level and at a culture company level. Like right. because, because managers have to set the expectation too of what those communications are. Um, you know, I think it's very healthy to disconnect. Right. To have times where you are available and also times when you are not, because yeah. either you're doing work that requires concentration or, by the way, the very valuable bit of not working. <laughs> it is important for your mental health and your mental acuity at work to have downtime. But I might miss out. I might not have money. I might not. I might get passed up. I, I make the immediate argument that you if you have made yourself so embedded in the organization that you can't be removed, you are actually a liability and you're first to go. Wow. <laughs> and so I, because, because, because no organization would necessarily want that single point of failure. I want to be so good that I've taught my people how to, how to do everything and enable them so much that I can step out and everything runs perfectly. <laughs> That's what I want. Something I used to say to my team, I used to say, if, if I need you, I don't want you. Yes. But if I don't need you because you've replaced yourself, you will always have a job. You will always have a job because, because by the way, I know that you're the kind of person that can continue to do that and can build me more and more productive systems that do things for, do things without having to be involved all the time. That is incredibly valuable, much more valuable than being Johnny on the spot, Jane, Jane go to, and being just the, the one person that's way more valuable to me to know that the system will always work. There are times when I've messaged my friend or my team on Slack and I know that they're going to get it because it, it's just right there, right? It's still on their phone after hours and sometimes they have notifications still on. So I'll do something because I'm trying to build that culture and I don't always do this and sometimes I do expect things responded quickly, but I will say something like no need to respond till tomorrow. Yep. And That's even important. just something like that for in this remote culture as a manager, as a leader, it's it's good to give people permission to have a life. Yeah, and set expectations too. Yeah. This is what I'm asking for. Yeah. Here is when I'm when I'm expecting. And by the way, it's okay for an employee to push back. Hey, I can't hit this deadline, but I can hit this one. Uh, and it's all, an, it, it is a communication. You don't want to say it's a negotiation sometimes, but it's actually a communication where we're working together. But this, by the way, is, is everything we've just talked about is not the technology, but in order to know about the technology, you have to know that you can do these things, that you can yeah. turn notifications on. That by the way, you can build very complicated search so that I can actually have you know information that I'm away available to me when I need it. But people have to be have to learn how to do that stuff. Those are some of the bits. Or or you can use tools like you know, we often use these collaboration and tasking tools where you can actually set up very intricate automations so that I know that I can send something off. It can get done by a number of people and touched and then return to me when it's the appropriate time. Or I can be alerted at when I need to to say that I need to go check into something because my expertise is needed to help fix something. And you can those tools do that, but they require deliberate investment to be effective that way. And by the way, you know, oftentimes we all talk about like the tools that we have. We have things like Microsoft 365 or Google Workplace. We bolt onto them quickly and go, oh, they're email. And we don't realize that there's all these other pieces where I can build workflows between my team, where I can actually route work between one another. I can get status information. I don't have to go hunt down people because the tools will tell me where all the work is. And if I need a status, I can pull that out. But oftentimes you have to build it and invest time in it. Again, that's why I like talking to the IT services companies. Right. They, should, they should be helping. But you as the, the consumer, you should know that you can do that rather than have to hunt down your people. What you just said there, I am fully guilty of. The 
the tools, like for example, Slack, I know there's, it can do way more than what I actually use it for. Yeah. You know, so I spend the money on it, but I'm not using the, the training of it. Now I'm not a nitty gritty detail IT guy. So this would be somewhere where if I wasn't the guy in charge, <laughs> then I, I really should have an IT person teaching me. But even as you're saying that, I was thinking to myself, maybe I should up this area so that I'm not, so I'm utilizing it to the fullest of what it, of how it could serve us. I'm sure yes. it could serve us more ways than what it's. And I, and I will, this is where I completely advocate. This is where your technology provider should be your partner to help you on that. They, they yeah. know what it's capable of. They can help you develop it. You know your business. You can couple that with their technology expertise and they should understand portions of your business too and help you implement that in the business. The tools can do really amazing stuff and can yeah. really open that up for that asynchronous work, for you to not have to, to manage the, the, the workload so such at a micro level with your people and instead spend your time on the two important things, the work, right? But also building the cultures and relationships with the people, which we've already acknowledged takes more time in a remote world. Yeah, fantastic. Dave, this has been so good. Uh, Dave and I are starting a new consultancy called the Dave Mike program. We're going to come in and tell you what to do. <laughs> Just kidding. Now that, you know, that that's, <laughs> isn't that what good consultants do is we come in and tell you what to do. <laughs> No, but really, Dave, this is great. Where can people find you? Because right now, I'm intrigued more. I'm thinking about some of these things. I wrote some notes off to the side. And so where can people find you? Where can people get a hold of your podcasts, your, your uh, news and all that? Yep. The easiest too is to find it at, at businessof.tech. That's the website. There's a big blue button there. You can find the podcast on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Or if you're a video person, you can find it on the YouTube channel where the, the, the business of text content all comes out. So you do, whether or not you're an audio person or a video person, you can get it in any way that you want to. And are you available for people shooting questions over? What do you do when people say, well, I was intrigued. I heard this. What do I do about that? Absolutely. I love having the conversations with, with, uh, with the audience to understand what their needs are and give you some direction. Oftentimes, what I'm going to then be advocating for is, is by the way, this is what you're going to want to talk to your technology provider about, because I think that's the, the direction you want to go. And if you're a technology provider and you're not connected with Dave, then definitely connect with him, follow up, because there's a lot of cutting edge things there. What I love here, Dave, is you're really bridging a gap between that technology provider and then the, the companies and the development of their employees. That's so, the space. <laughs> well done. Well done. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dave. This has been absolutely fascinating. Before I let you off and we wrap up, there's a glove in the background that when you told me what it was, I was I had this pleasant memory of the my childhood. So, can you tell the the older people like remind us what it is? And maybe the it is people tell us what it is. Absolutely. So it is the Nintendo Power Glove, which which those who remember are late or released in the early or the late eighties. Isn't that uh, crazy? The late eighties. I know the late eighties uh, for the Nintendo Entertainment System or NES, uh, and you would slide it on and you could hold it in front of the your 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 screen your old school crt and you could move it around and it had consoles on it It was the early days of motion control and it there was a cheesy movie called the wizard that was released at the time that yeah. actually helped promote it uh, where it was the debut of super mario brothers 3 for those of us that are that old school and one of my hobbies is is retro video game collecting so i actually collect some of those old pieces of hardware and and the games that uh, that are all still working in my home studio I oh, love it. That's so fun. So oh, my guess, a couple of people are Googling it right now, checking it out or having some fond memories. Well, Dave, thank you so much. This has been absolutely fun to have you on the show. Mike, this has been a blast. Thanks for having me. And to all of our listeners and all of our viewers, thank you so much for taking time to listen. This is to help you out. So make sure you like, subscribe, share, comment, and we'll see you next time on Masters of Employee Development. Thanks for listening to Advance with Mike Acker, a podcast designed to provide an edge for leaders through improving practical leadership skills and increasing confidence in speaking. Mike is a best-selling author and business owner who has helped many leaders increase their skills and their confidence, propelling them to new heights in their personal and professional endeavors. 
Join an incredible group of professionals taking the steps to become better leaders at connect.stepstoadvance.com. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. 